Woohoo! We made it again. <laughs> Hello, folks. <laughs> so Hello, great to see you. So many people here waiting happily for, for us. And uh, messages for us all already. Um, Michael Darby's wow. here. Matt's here. James is here. Ernie's here. Virginia's here. Uh, Libba's here. Sibylla, hello there. <laughs> Diane, Janet, Nick, and way. The list goes on. I feel fantastic. I forget. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. And 54 people in total. If you haven't been with us before, folks, welcome. And uh, although I, I probably can't see all the comments, they're whizzing past so quickly, I'll do my best to register w when I see you. But please do uh, leave a comment. Let us know uh, who you are and, uh, and where you're from and, uh, and say hello. And um, if you haven't already subscribed to us, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, down below. Yes, so yes, welcome. Yes. Say some yeah. words, Rupert. How's the world with you? Oh, always wonderful when you uh, when you all uh, pop up and join us. It's roasting down here in the sunny south of France. It actually hasn't been that sunny. It's been overclass, but it is so humid. Yeah, it's like yeah. a sauna in here. Yeah, we've been uh, uh, doing that. Um, hello to Sandra. Hello to Susie Cat. Hello to Gillian. Hello, <laughs> good to <see> Sue. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I said uh, the like and subscribe thing, haven't mm. I? What would you it's know. last time we came on two weeks seemed to have flown by today. It, it seems like deep. ages since actually we, we since the last time we, we were with you. That means there must have been loads going on. Or what have we been up to? Let's share with um with everybody what uh well, what's been happening. Well, um, <laughs> okay, well. On my end of things, it's the eternal march of, ret uh, of researching and writing all the time. And don't get me wrong, love it. Um, uh, but the reading list gets longer. It never gets shorter. Um, and All in uh, a good cause. Yes, definitely all in a good cause. And, you know, because we're rolling sort of three or four projects on the go at any one time. Yeah. Uh, you know, which can be writing some of the stuff that we're going to be filming next year, uh, you know, uh, writing some of the stuff that we're going to be filming next month, you know, the next prehistory show or whatever, collating all the archaeology news from around the world and sifting through all of that, deciding what should we tell you about, because we can't tell you about everything. Um, it's just this unbelievable amount of stuff going on all the time. Um, yeah, One kind of me, my mind is still humming. I wish I was a standing stone. <laughs> Wasn't that good? How and that is something that's that happened in the in the two weeks. Has <laughs> actually been finishing off the last uh, uh, prehistory show, which uh, I hope yeah. you've um, had a chance to look at by now, now, now folks. That would uh, make sense of. Uh, my 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 moan mine, mine <laughs> uh, humming. Um, I wish I was a standing stone. It's a dreadful yes. earworm, that tune. Yes. It's stuck in my mind for ages. So <laughs> we're glad to have got the um, the the last um, show. It's only the second one we've done, and uh, we. I mean, the feedback has been great. Please do let us know. You know mm. what your thoughts are. Uh, on the prehistory show, how that's going, and whether you like the the format or not, um, we're enjoying enjoying do, doing them. But it's a bit of a learning curve, learning how to stuff all the work we've got to do into the t into the uh, four weeks, so it actually comes out uh, uh, once yes. a, a month. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You'd think four weeks was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it <really> yeah. isn't. <laughs> And just published just earlier this evening was a really a throwback to uh, a long time ago, it seems now, 2007, when we released the Standing With Stones onto DVD. One of the extras was an interview with Rupert and I looking considerably younger. Me, certainly considerably hairier and beardier. You, you did have hair. Um, uh, yeah, about the making of Standing With Stones. I know it's been a question that's popped up so many times is uh, how we met and how it got started and 
and what mm. the process was. So if you've got any of those burning questions still, you've watched Standing with Stones and uh, want a bit <laughs> more background. Um, yes. Uh, if I remember, uh, on the recording of this, uh, there'll be, not, it'll be over there, won't it? Somewhere over there. Uh, there'll be a, a pop-up, a link to it, so you can watch it. But it's easy to find at the moment because it's the last thing we uh, <laughs> we put out there. Um. Not to forget, of course, um, I have to shout out that um, all the folks what have joined us on Patreon in the last uh, couple of weeks. Mm. So that's a shout out to Paul Emerson, Caroline Proctor, Mary Haffenruffer, Louise, Louise Bennett, James Ribchester, uh, and that's it. Oh, and people who uh, joined us in... Uh, July are probably still waiting on their badges. Uh, those that qualify for the uh, our Blue Peter badges are uh, free history nice, guys badges. It? Yes. Um, so it that's a, it's a measure of how busy we've been that I haven't managed to get those in the post, but yeah. they're not forgotten. Uh, uh, believe me. <laughs> um, so that's that. What else am I Sorry, referring to my list of things, <laughs> things to... To say, do you know what? An interesting thing um, I suddenly realised. I, I I was thinking to myself about the stuff that's on Patreon, and a lot of you guys I can see are already uh, some of our Patreon supporters. So forgive me, you already know this, but just the Monday Megaliths alone. The Monday Megalith is a podcast we regularly do, but it's only ex it's exclusive for. Uh, Pat Patreon folk. We do it every single Monday. Do you know how many we've done so far, Rupert? <laughs> Off the top of your head? Off the top of my head? No, go on, I don't. 24. Ridiculous, isn't it? Seems like just yesterday we started uh, doing that. That is six hours of just Monday Megalith podcasts alone. How did that happen? I know. Every every week we uh, we we get together and we uh, chat amongst ourselves about you know one of the megaliths we visited up and down the country and uh, yeah. people seem seem to enjoy it. The point is that's just one of the perks that's available on on Patreon. Um, there are a vast number of other uh, perks and stuff. Uh, early access to um, a lot of our our stuff. Um, uh, films that you won't get to see uh, anywhere else. And, of course, all the audio uh, podcasts uh, from the last two years. We, we started in March in 2018. Anyway, I'm uh, wittering a bit. Anything you're else we need to say before we um, start off? Uh, well, seeing as you're talking about uh, what else you get for Patreon, is that, um, yeah. uh, that, that our content on YouTube that does have advertising uh, or you know, moving forward stuff that has slightly more advertising. Well, it's all it's all available on Patreon without any advertising at all. So there is another reason for going there. Um, for sure, yeah. And uh, to quickly catch up with that, you may have noticed that there's no advertising on any of our uh, YouTube stuff at the moment. So that's a still an ongoing uh, saga. But we think we've sold it once and for all. We'll see next month. Um, have, yeah. yeah. Just before we start. A little question to you folks. How many of you are interested in gear? Because when we get out and about, you know, we like our gear. We like our, our cameras and, and stuff that we use and, and drones. Uh, uh, when we do manage to go, get out and about and, and filming, it's been our, in our minds to uh, do a little special about um, the geeky side of what we do. Well, we if... have had a few people asking us, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't us just going off on one. Uh, we have had people saying, "What do you use?" So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, if 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 that appeals in any way, um, just uh, let us know in the the comments. Mm. I'll just uh, I'll do my best to observe. Um, yeah. And yes, well, as you know, we're all gathered here to for us to have a stab at answering questions that uh, you've posed to us during the last. Um, couple of weeks. We've got 10 great questions uh, lined up. Forgive us mm. if you um, put a question in and it's not answered tonight. I mean, it's a point, actually, isn't it, Rupert? I think because we do get quite a lot of questions, we've, we've got to we be, uh, we've got to edit 
um, just a little bit. So if things are outside our remit, sort of not really prehistory questions, then we might pass them by. Yes. Anything yes, further? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> that's the thing. We are the prehistory guys. Good grief. <laughs> If, if yeah, if we started answering answering historical questions, then uh, uh, oh, it would yeah. just go on forever, wouldn't it? Really. <clears throat> yes. Michael W says gear is always interesting. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Yes. Anyway, um, so I think that's about it. I think we can uh, actually start answering some questions now. Go on then. All right. I tell you what. Okay, and so these these are going to be these are going to be answered in the order in which they were posted. So, to yeah. be first up, you need to be first up when uh, get your questions in straight away when Rupert posts the the post next time. Anyway, I will bring up the question. Our first question is from William William Cortland, and Hello, um, William. William asks: um, Is there any evidence? of pre-pottery B in England, as to ask, is calcium uh, oxide found um, uh, near to non-limestone, uh, sorry, what, uh, attached to non-linear limestone rock, or is it found in higher con concentrations in the soil near dressed, uh, near dressed around Bronze Age stone circles? Um, is there ever a layer of it found as flooring sealants, or is that not that is is that not found in England until the Romans? It's a complicated question, and we have several well, angles of answering. We we do. It's a complicated question with a very simple answer. Um, yes. The simple answer is no. <laughs> uh, you ask, is there any evidence for pre-pottery B uh, in England? No, there isn't. Pre-pottery yeah. B, um, for uh, for those of you that don't know, pre-pottery is it, it basically it's the name given to uh, ceramic work, um, objects made of clay, uh, but before pottery was, for want of a better word, industrialized. That's probably not the right word. But what word would you use then, Michael? Um, um, it's, well, so, so well, for example, I mean, it's difficult to use our terminology. Mass produced is not good. Uh, um, um, in common everyday use all over the goddamn place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so pre-pottery, there's three phases of pre-pottery. Pre-pottery A is basically clay artifacts and little figurines. Um, you know, uh, very often it's just a, a torso, you know, little things made of clay where someone has just scooped up a lump of gloopy clay and made something out of it. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of clay objects like that, and they date to, say, 12,000, I think pre-pottery A is about 12,000, yeah. uh, roughly, B.C., to 10,000, 10, 12,000 B.C. Then you've got pre-pottery B, and we're which talking, is... And we're talking particularly, you know, dispersed from Mesopotamia. And, yes, yeah. Mesopotamia, Anatolia. So you're, you're talking about Middle East and northwards, Gre modern day uh, Greece, Turkey, and yeah. and Middle East essentially. Um, and then pre pottery B, pre pottery B, there were actually pots as well, but yeah. um, but you know the pressed, um, uh, so just formed by hand out of lumps of clay and the, the earliest or even carved out of out of harder materials like alabaster and and true too things like yes. that yeah um and pre-pottery b is around nine thousand, and then pre-pottery c is again obviously more sophisticated and coming down to i think seven thousand bc so so you've got none of that really of the none of the pre-pottery certainly pre-pottery b no no yeah. evidence for it in britain at all um, now, the, que <laughs> the question about calcium oxide. Okay, well, calcium oxide, um, more commonly known as quicklime, um, and it's it's used. Oh, it's still used uh, in production of, uh, of 
ceramics and glass production. Um, historically, prehistorically, uh, then I'm personally not aware of any in in Britain going back anything like that. Far. No, Are you, I, Michael? Uh, you know, I mean... No, uh, again, it, it is attached to, maybe, you know, the larger quantities, are. it's attached to the making of uh, lime plaster for flooring, which mm. is kind of assumed that the, it's been associated with um, kilns and firing. Mm. But if we talk to, if you talk to Merrin Dinely, and others, yeah. they'll tell you that there's a distinct possibility that the liming of floors, and we we're talking about earlier and, and, and uh, o over there, may have been for the purposes of, of the brewing of beer, mm. or certainly fermentation of one sort or another. It's an interesting point. Go in, can't go into it now. Um, but uh, mm. no, there's another little point though in William's uh, question that needs to be addressed. Is it found mm. in higher concentrations in the soil near dressed or around Bronze Age stone circles? The thing is, nothing's likely to be, have been found near <laughs> stone circles because stone circles don't tend to get excavated. No. Because there's, there's, Archaeologists have learnt there's very little return on investment. The ROI is low on on a stone circle. Certainly, historically, has been, um, and we would mm. moot that um, that would be incorrect if it just went out and did geophys now on a lot of stone circles. That's another, but that's another story. Mm. Um, I don't think there's anything more to be said. I'm afraid about. Not uh, really. That, no, that I mean it's a great it's, question. It, uh, great question, William. But um, but yeah, there's your answer. No, not really. No. <laughs> no. Okay, mm. Janet. Uh, Janet um, McKinnon, what's your opinion of the Neolithic yard as a concept? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, well, okay. I'm going to be brutally honest here. And this sounds dismissive. It's not. My attitude to the megalithic yard is, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, the, for me, the, the most important thing about our ancestors is clearly they could measure. Uh, clearly they had some pretty sophisticated systems going on. Um, for me... Deciding or uh, or figuring out what um, units they used, it, in some ways it's academic. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of theories about. Um, uh, well, when Alexander Tom came up with the megalithic yard, um, because he analysed, oh god, it was hundreds of sites, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, hundreds and hundreds. Um, and and he came up with this figure, and uh, and I think you know today we still have the yard and we still have the meter, which give or take, are pretty much the same thing. You know, one's three inches bigger than the other, or you know, seven centimeters, or you know, whatever. Uh, so the fact that our ancestors back then would have had a measure that was in the same ballpark, point eight think, three. Point eight three okay. meters, eighty three centimeters. It's close enough, you know. It's yeah. it's it's something like two and three quarter feet, isn't it? Something <clears> like that. Uh, um, two point seven two. That'll <laughs> do for me. <laughs> so, I have Wikipedia <laughs> open here. <laughs> oh, do you? Okay, yes, well, I I could. Yeah. Well, in that case, you know me. <laughs> um, <but laughs> I could pretend. Uh, but I I think uh, in many ways I find that almost inevitable. Because, um, you know, any of you who, who may have done um, any outdoor um, sort of orienteering work or, or um, what do you call it, uh, just expedition work, map using work, and that, all that kind of stuff. Cartography. That, that to, well, no, the fact that to, if you want to measure your distance on the landscape, then oh. you can average it to two steps. Yeah, yeah. Left, right. That's a yard. Yeah. So if you do 200 steps, you've done 100 yards. Um, yeah. uh, that's, you know, and th that's that's such ballpark. I mean, you you know, you'd mm -hmm. have to, uh, 
it, you'd, you'd refine it with your own calculations. But generally speaking, so the fact that somebody going back then would have uh, would have done a, a number of paces to figure out a size, yeah. and that after a period of time they standardised that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no, there's no surprise if you begin to use statistics, and that's the only way of whether there was a, some kind of standard measure, and lo and behold, it comes out to round about the yard, you know, <laughs> that it's, it's not exactly uh, surprising. The, 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 I very, very, very much doubt there was such a thing as a unified megalithic yard that is so, uh, you know, of our time to have a standardized mm. measure. And we look at things through that lens. And uh, I think the establishment of unified me measure would, some would be something you would strive for, w you know, whatever you use, but you, there would be, could be, there could be no, it's unlikely for there to have been an overarching authority that determined this was your measure that you must use in that circle and that circle and that circle. Do you know what? I half agree with you. Yeah? Um, well, I, I think that... <laughs> uh, <with> the, <laughs> um, I think that if you were... Um, well, OK, we make no bones about the fact that we dismiss the temple notion of... Uh, of many, many sites. We're not saying there were no temples. We're just saying it's silly to call everything a temple. And so if you're starting to look at why people would have used sites and what they would have used them for, <clears throat> those of you that have seen Standing With Stones will know that uh, we think certain places would have been uh, or potentially could have been sporting arenas because sports uh, in humanity, that's been something that's been, you know, competition. It's what we're about. Um, and and so I think that to have standard things so that people were always, um, uh, you know, they they would they were doing the same things in different places. There was a common marker. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I, I I do agree with you, but I also think there's potential for standardisation that um, I, I don't think we should play down their potential. Oh no no, I don't, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to do that. You just mean I, it wasn't I think it's something they to. would have striven for because, yeah. it, as far as trade is concerned, as soon as you do have a unified measure of whatever it is length, weight, whatever, then trade opens up massively. Yeah. Um, yes, and Susie Cat, I have read Uriel's Machine. <laughs> mm. um, yes, and uh, for James, a yard is his garden. Is his... <laughs> yeah. A yard is where my garden is located. Yeah. <laughs> Two yeah. nations divided so, by a common language. <laughs> yeah. I, the, the, uh, the answer to the question is... Um, yeah. All hail to anybody that does all that work, you know, trying to work something out. But we're still unconvinced because it's, mm. uh, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it, you'd get that result if you did. It is. It makes sense that uh, people pacing an area um, would pace an area to get their measure, and if they did that, they, yeah. the measurements would group around, and st yeah. statistically that. Uh, um, yeah. length would emerge if you did all yeah. the measurements, that many measurements. You know, so. I, I think, that, you know, the essential thing really is that the units don't matter. You know, it, the geometry itself, anything you, you like in geometry can be mm. done with any unit. You know, if you want to make a circle, well, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be imperial or metric in any way. It can be just completely random yeah. to make yourself yeah. a perfect circle and any division thereof. Do you so, know what I'm going? I'm going to just go off on one and digress. It's something I spent some time thinking about it, and it's not mm -hmm. something I have a conclusion or you know anything like that about. But one way of establishing a unitary measure would be to use the some sort of celestial arrangement or the movement of the sun or the moon, and measure over time. That would be a constant. That you know that you could use that using sticks and stuff and shadows on the ground, you could use that as a constant to establish a measure. Think on. You could, you could but if and you're going to... 
yeah, do you know what? We could. We could talk for hours on that. So exactly. Like, yes. I think we should move <laughs> along. So, uh, uh, Derek, Derek Whitaker, um, what Hello, are Derek. our thoughts on lost consonants such as Atlantis, etc.? Yay. <laughs> mm. um, open house, open door again. Um, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I think. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to decide which way to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Mythology. So, so Plato wrote about Atlantis, yeah. and um, and pretty much everything about Atlantis can be tracked back to Plato. Sure. Um, I I don't think there's. I don't think I'm wrong in that. I don't think there's anything before Plato that talks about it. Um, anyway, <clears throat> um, the the thing is, you're talking about a period in uh, in the past when uh, mapping of the of the world was by no means standardised. You know, we didn't have. You know, we all have the luxury now <laughs> outside of Google Earth and uh, Google Maps. Yeah. You know, we can all take an atlas off the shelf and we will all look at the Mercator projection. Everybody sees the world in the same way, even though it's completely wrong when you look at the relation of, you know, Greenland yeah, yeah. in relation to the size of Africa, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, it's amazing how many uh, Americans don't actually know the real size of America in relation to Africa. Um <laughs> It's, you know, it's an interesting thing. But the point is that if you take away our modern view of the world and go back to a time when you've, you, if you've got a map, you've got a, a localised regional map and it's arbitrary what's in the centre. Now, if you go out to oh, pick anywhere you like, if you go up into Scandinavia, you know, what is going to be the centre of your world? Um, you know, go down to well, okay, the, the uh, you know civilizations, sophisticated civilizations in Anatolia in the Middle East. What is going to be the centre of your world? Mm. So to then project that, well, if you go out across the ocean this way, you come across Atlantis. Well, what could it have been the Azores? Um, maybe. Could it have been something that if Plato was picking up something from uh, from oral tradition myth, then could we have been talking about a period when, uh, going back however many thousands into the past, where uh, thousands of years into the past, when sea levels were lower and there were more islands, there were more, uh, you know, peaks popping up all over the place? We don't know. Um, and, you know, there's, there's one theory that... Um, if I've got a book somewhere. Uh, but there's one theory that... Um, if you follow, uh, you know, so basically go west. Across the Atlantic, go west. What do you get to? Ultimately, you get to South America. And there's all this talk of gold in Atlantis. Well, you know, that's pretty much what the Spanish found when they got there. So this theory is that, well, South America is Atlantis. Maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that basically what I'm getting at is that we take what somebody wrote a couple of thousand years ago at a time when mapping was not half as sophisticated as it is now, and we try to make that vagary sit with our luxury of exactitude, mm. and they don't belong together. Mm. Um, and uh, I don't think this is irrelevant, if you'll permit me to just go off on one, but uh, the, for me, the best example of this is the Piri Reis map where people have said for ages people have said that the Piri Reis map shows the uh, the coast of South America and then the landmass of Antarctica so clearly this map was created where or before Antarctica was covered in ice Therefore, this map that Piri Reis, the uh, yeah. um, was he Portuguese navigator, that the but the map that Piri Reis was using had to have been copied from a map that was created tens of thousands of years in the past. 
And people have said that forever. Mm. But the reality is, and you can do this by taking the Piri Reese map and just do it with Photoshop, uh, that what happened was when that map was being drawn, the cartographer had a piece of vellum. Vellum, expensive thing to have. Frequently it was reused. If, if what was on your vellum became redundant, then, uh, then they would scratch it off with a blade so they could use it again. So clearly people didn't have loads and loads of big pieces of vellum with them. They were very careful about how much they used. So this cartographer had the job, he was on the ship, and he had the job of mapping the coast of South America as they sailed down it. And it kept on going and it kept on going, because let's face it, South America is huge. And he got down to close to the bottom of his piece of vellum and they were still going. So he turned the vellum sideways and he carried on drawing the map. And uh, if you actually take that, go and find the Piri Reese map and, and do that, straighten it out in Photoshop or something similar, and you can see the rivers and the inlets and the bays. That's all it is. It's just the coast of South America going all the way down. That's it. You know, and, and, and that shows why, you know, it's modern mindset. People are looking at a map thinking, well, surely they knew this. Yeah. And, uh, and though they didn't. It's the luxury yeah. of, you know, we see the world with very, very different eyes. Kevin Riley says areas devastated by flood gave, ri gave rise to folk memory everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. For, uh, Every um, the if five, five, five getting inundated for the ancients was the whole world. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good point. It's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. Um, uh, and every um, every culture has a flood myth. Uh, you know, whether they all relate to exactly the same flood yeah. is moot point, but um, but certainly... I, I can't help thinking that, you know, freshest from folk memory, you know, of that kind of inundation for Plato, although it's, you know, still a reach, still a reach back, would still be the inundation of Doggerland. Maybe. Now, what, do you know what? I have to confess that this is, is, is getting so much into history that my brain just yeah, goes... Yeah, yeah. Um, but do you remember what date Plato was? No. Neither do I. I'm wondering if... Um, because I think Santorini uh, would have been well before Plato, wouldn't it? Um, Santorini was, what was it, 1600 BC? Yeah, uh, Plato 400... BC. Yeah. Yeah. So Santorini would have been, I think, close enough. That's a good point, Mike. Um, yeah. uh, Santorini, quite, quite possibly. Yeah. You know, when basically. <laughs> Atlantis was dog a bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But as you can tell, uh, Derek, you, you've you've bowled us a googly with that one, and uh, yeah. To be well, honest, we don't often think everybody. about Atlantis, do we? <laughs> well, you know, it, I think and, it's and that because sort of stuff. It, you know, you probably know, depending on how much of our stuff you've seen, you, you know yeah. that we we don't do the ancient aliens thing. You know, there's usually, um, I say usually, there's pretty much always yeah. a very common sense explanation to pretty much everything yeah. uh, you you just need to really look for it rather than actually leaping onto the well actually i'd quite like it to be something mystical therefore i'll i'll go with this one yeah um right. oh i've then, been down that road myself many a time i was saying it was in reply you know read mm. whereas uriel's machine uh, jolly good book had me well convinced <laughs> mm. Um, and many others uh, besides. But, uh, yes, critical thinking, critical thinking. We'll get on to that. Yes. Um, actually, while we've, uh, before we move on to the next thing, there's just something I wanted to say that I omitted um, from the chat at the top and the, uh, the housekeeping at the top, is that uh, I know a huge proportion of the folks that are engaging with us now on the chat here are already our Patreon supporters, um, which is uh, fabulous, and we love seeing you here. Um, 
we I have heard I have had queries though from um, people, and I've seen it indicated by people looking for another way. You know, enjoy what we do. Um, uh, that have t uh, been through everything that's on offer. Seen Standing with Stones. Seen the the podcast. Seen the other films uh, that we do, but aren't comfortable with uh, committing to um, you know a monthly pledge, as it were, and asked if there is a way of just making a single small uh, donation or what have you. Um, if you look down in the uh, description box below, you'll see there's a link to Patreon, but also now there's a link to uh, a PayPal button, a PayPal donate button. So if anybody wishes to, uh, you know, who's enjoyed our stuff and wants uh, to find a way of uh, showing their appreciation without committing to the Patreon thing, then uh, uh, click on the um, um, uh, PayPal uh, link below and it will enable you to do that. And if you're considering doing that, thank you very much you, indeed. Yes, yes, you wonderful people. You, you really do help us do our work. And, um, you yeah. know, it, you, you do make a huge difference to what we do. So and apropos of that as, as well, that I'm thinking, I haven't confirmed that, that maybe, you know, single amounts now, because we will be, ah, do you know, while I'm talking about it, I'm going to ask another question and uh, <laughs> of, of you folk, and it's this. Uh, Rupert and I, in the coming weeks, will be launching a crowdfunding, um, a Kickstarter campaign in order to fund the um, larger capital amounts that we'll need to um, make the films that we want to make in the next year. Most specifically, um, uh, you know, we want to make a big number about Kalanish. We've, we've, we've already got um, uh, great support from... Uh, folks up there at the visitor centre and from Alison Sheridan to, to do that but obviously it's going to cost money in the end so we're going to be creating a crowdfunding campaign um, to fund that. If anybody out there is familiar where, you know, about the strategies and, uh, and best practice as far as creating a Kickstarter campaign is concerned, if you've got any experience and advice we would welcome it you know um, mm. you, you know what we're doing and, and you know what we're about and we, you know what we're what our starting point kind of and uh, we just want to get it right so if, if anybody's got any wise words um, send mm. them our way they'd be most welcome. I think um, it, it's um, uh, it's good that you you raised that mark I, uh, I, I would add to that um, because it, it, I can imagine uh, a few of you would wonder, oh, okay, what's the difference? You're doing all this all the time. What, what difference does that make? And the simple fact is that uh, we can, uh, you know, something like this, you know, we can sit down and we can, uh, you know, uh, broadcast stuff to you. We can make the monthly shows in a way that our, um, our investment in them is our time. We're, we're now, basically, we're doing this all the time. Um yeah. And uh, and so the amount of money it costs is our time. Yeah. And we live a moderately hand to mouth existence. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you know, we can do this stuff because it's our time when it comes to making a um, a quality of film that I mean, a bit like Standing with Stones. Yeah. Um, Keep, the, keeping we, the bar high. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, we're not going to compromise on quality. But when it means that we're going, you know, that far, the investment, not just in time, but in, uh, in you know, in real costs as well, yeah. uh, they become a lot more significant. So that's why we yeah. have to fund them uh, quite separately from, yeah. you know, the, the normal. They're, they're, not, they're not a cash flow production. problem. They're a capital problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. why. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyway, watch out for that. Watch out for us uh, developing that and, and launching mm. that. Um, it's something we need to get on board with and, and get moving pretty quickly because uh, before we know where we are, next year will be upon us. And, uh... It will. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Moving right along. James. Hello, James. James Bagby says, I was watching the Bella Snap Stonescape. Okay, here's another one. If I remember... Other way. 
I'll put a link up in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, well done. For the, on the recording of this to take you mm. to the Bela Snap Stonescape little two and a half minute film of, of Bela Snap that I made, God, almost two years ago now. Anyway, mm. James was immediately struck by the fact that the mound looks like a stone axe head. Thoughts? Mm. Aha. Do you know what? Mm. I don't think you're um, the first to have that thought. Mm. And if I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I think our friend Timothy Darville said words to that effect. That Did it's he? the thought he that has crossed his uh, mind. He's probably <clears throat> never pub put that in words in any um, publication himself. But I, think I don't know. A, Do you know? I, I, I have to. Somebody I, has though, and it wasn't. It wasn't one of us that sort of. I'm sure no, it was. It wasn't because the. the there is a, a completely different theory that Bella Snap is representative of the reclining female form. Yes, which is um, what, and, the one I tend to align with. Yeah, I, I have to confess it doesn't really convince me. I can I can go with the fact that you know the the deceased are being returned to the womb, yeah. um, but I you know I get the concept. Um, I just think that if they wanted to make a representation of a reclining female form, they could have done a better job. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, um, I, you know, that's that's why we know that they were capable. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, but uh, do you know what, James? I I know what you mean. It it does look like an axe, and and particularly somewhere like Bella Snap, where you've got burials in the sides which well is is that where your handle goes through yeah but there's such a variety they're, 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 they're you know so I mean? rare they, uh, it's, yeah. it's interesting you know that i i was at uh, arthur's stone a couple of week, weeks ago uh, that's another one with a side entrance a particular side entrance yeah. even the, so, um, it, it's interesting isn't it because um because so technically, it's a seven-class world. <laughs> well, Sibylla so, says, oh, save us from the female form stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our fault. We hear you. It's not our fault. It wasn't <laughs> our idea. As I said, I'm unconvinced by it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, the, th the thing is, uh, Bella Snap, <laughs> um, Wayland's, West Kennet, Stony Little Turn, that they conform pretty well to that form, um, but then Tinkins Wood, that's so blocky, it's so completely rectangular, yeah, uh, in plan uh, view. As are many things, you know, that are called Seven Cotswold Tombs. Yeah, um, uh, you know, the the, uh, the plan view is is far from. Um, Consistent, shall we say? Yeah. Mind you, axe heads are not exactly consistent themselves, are they? So, uh, I d don't know. I'm afraid the conversation doesn't really get us anywhere. That's the end. It doesn't, because it, it's of just the it's a we maybe. can't arrive um, at it. At Michael is more convinced by the uh, the female form theory. I'm I'm just as happy kinda, with the kinda. axe theory. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We could all go away and write a thesis, <laughs> and uh, we yeah. yeah. Right, I'm sorry. It's a uh, it's uh, it's one another of our series of non-answers, really. I suppose, yeah, sorry, isn't it, James? Don't we 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 won't apologise. There's so much we can't know, isn't it? Uh, isn't there? Well, that's half the fun, really. Yeah, Ty Ty Bashieri says asks. Hello, Ty. Uh, this gets a bit complicated. Where are the wooden henges beyond Durrington Walls and what age are they generally considered to be? I thought they were built before the stone ones, but not Durrington. What would that mean? Durrington being erected later? There's a bit to unpack in that question. Well, for the clarity. honest truth is, I didn't really understand what Ty was getting at. <laughs> Kevin um. says maybe it's a mound shaped mound. <laughs> Sorry um, to <laughs> intrude upon mm. your thoughts there. Well, it, um, 
It depends what Ty means by beyond Durrington. Yeah. Um, if, he, if he means generally speaking. Um, well, yeah, there's beyond Durrington, as in Woodhenge, which is, you know, outside the walls of, you know, well, okay, inside of Durrington. What you mean by and beyond. there's beyond Durrington walls to include the whole of exactly. British Isles, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think Are you there, Ty? You, you, you can't you uh, there, clarify Ty, your then question. Do, uh, do chip in. Um, because uh, when Vince Gaffney, when they were first excavating, uh, for, they weren't excavating, when they were first surveying and suggesting that there was this huge hi, stone Patricia. Circle. Sorry, um, Rupert, hi, carry Patricia. Sorry, Rupert, Patricia. No, that's all right. Um, uh, and then they found out that they weren't stones, that these things that were showing up uh, weren't stones at all. They were holes. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm i not sure if when, you, when you're talking about uh, Durrington and its age in relation to stones, I don't know if you mean that you thought there was a stone circle at Durrington mm -hmm. or if you're referring to something different. Yeah. So I think the clearest thing that we can say now, and do feel free to refine the question and send it in again, yeah. But the clearest thing that we can say now is that there was, if you go back a couple of decades, there was a thinking that enclosures, uh, they had a chronology of uh, causewayed enclosure becoming palisaded enclosure, becoming henge. And um, and excavations, more modern excavations, have shown this is actually not the case. Yeah. that they uh, they really did overlap in time enormously. And the implication is really that they served very different purposes. Yeah. I'm just going to say, uh, Healing Art, welcome. Glad you could make it. Good to see you. And um, Radstar, good morning from Scott. Is that... <laughs> Hello. Hello, that's not folks. a truncation Thanks of Scotland. That's good morning from Scott, your name, I presume. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Anyway, sorry, Rupert. Carry on. Um, no, have sorry, you made your I, point I, about that? Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I think so. Um, it's interesting know, it, that Ty says wooden hinges, and that's the confusing term uh, because yes. a hinge isn't wooden. Isn't a, wooden. <laughs> a, a hinge is a ditch and a bank. Yeah, uh, it's circular enclosure with a ditch and a bank. Um, so, if you mean by a, by wooden enclosures, if you mean uh, if you mean a palisaded enclosure. Yeah. That's a wooden enclosure. If you mean the timber post sites like Stanton Drew or Durrington, yeah. then again something different. Um, so yeah, well, I, I mean you've got the you've got the the wooden uh, enclosures within Durrington Walls itself. In, in fact, yes. I think there are two of them. Two two uh, uh, mm. circular um, collections of post holes within uh, Durrington Walls. Yes. Uh, we started out talking about the wooden, uh, you know, which they thought was a stone circle, which turned out to be essentially something they changed into the henge. They had originally had yeah. wooden posts, huge wooden posts in that circle, but they got taken down and the uh, the ditch is pretty well much where that uh, circle of, or is it the bank, got built over where the post holes are anyway. Uh, carry on, folks. I'm sure you can still hear me, um, but it seems what? that my camera has gone on. <laughs> what the have way. you done? <laughs> uh, no, it's just that I think uh, that for some reason the batteries run out on, on the Lumix there. Oh, fair uh, enough. So uh, carry on. I will uh, change the battery. Okie dokie. <laughs> well, um, can I say anything else about these enclosures? Because um, uh, it would be nice to, have, you know, as I said, you know, do feel free to refine and send in that question again because it's it is a very interesting subject. Um, palisaded enclosures as a whole, and the reason I'm picking palisaded enclosures as an uh, you know specifically out of your question is because they're the ones that were surrounded by wooden walls. Uh, so many of them had uh, you know massive tree trunks. You know, these things that were sometimes a, a metre in diameter yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, forming a wall. Why do you need a wall that thick? And uh, there is a presumption that because they were that thick, 
it was because they were really tall, um, you know, because you're not, uh, well, it's the most efficient way of making a tall one is to have it that wide. But in actual fact, it's far more likely that they weren't tall at all, that if they were short, let's say for the sake of argument, fence height, then a mature tree uh, that's going to give you uh, a metre in diameter is probably going to be quite tall and it's going to mm. give you an awful lot of fence height stumps yeah. that uh, that you can then uh, uh, make your wall. Now, the Hindwell enclosure in, in Wales, which is the biggest palisaded enclosure known. Now, Hindwell is... Oh, God, when does it date to? Um, it's old. Um, Hindwell goes back to, it's getting on 5,000 years old, I think. It might even be older than that. Um, uh, but that's, was, that's, it, that's a huge different sort of enclosure, that was, isn't it? In, well, the point is it's a palisaded enclosure. Yeah, yeah. That is so huge, and it yeah. has a cursus monument skimming one edge of it. Yes. Um, but the point <laughs> is that they, they used, it was over 1,500 trees or posts to yeah. uh, to make the walls of that enclosure it is vast yeah. um and and, um, we, we, and we marvel at the transport of, of huge stones and the erection of huge stones which we can still see there but completely yeah. bypass this m momentous um yeah. use of of timber and timber yeah. you know is not it, light it's not big tree weighs, big yeah. Big tree weighs more than a largish stone by yeah, a long way. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know if I'm ask, uh, answering Ty's uh, question. Uh, uh, Diane has a, a good point. Diane Spears that uh, apparently Mike Pe Parker Pearson's uh, Stonehenge and New Understanding has a lot of details about wooden circles in his beginning chapters so you know maybe that's something we could all have a have a look at there um but Dur as far as Durrington being erected later is concerned i mean i know we're looking at it through a rather the long end of the telescope but this stuff is going on with um pretty much at the same time the the mm. stuff we're talking about here you know those t timber circles you know th that aren't palisaded enclosures, but have a certain enig enigma about them, you know, like the cluster at uh, Stanton Drew, and like the stuff inside Durrington uh, walls. Um, th these things were f um, contemporaneous, and if one before the other, then following one very hard upon the other, as far as mm. Durrington is concerned. Mm. It's not an area we know enough about, you know, uh, how... Uh, timber timber was used in relation no, to... No, it, it's stuff. important to... Uh, do you know what? <laughs> this. This is actually a two-volume piece. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, it is... Um, yes, it... there's two of these. Look, I can't tell you. It's, it's really dense paper as well. These, um, They weigh a ton. And yeah. these are basically uh, the most recent and comprehensive uh what's the word i want um compilation of data on enclosures of uh well early ne neolithic enclosures of, of uh, southern britain and ireland yeah. now uh <laughs> the dating and everything in these it's it the, the depth of information is just bonkers we both um, have copies yeah, we do. <laughs> um, we were just s scared to death of starting to dive into uh, them. You know, I, is... I, I, I dip in and I, I do the index thing. It's like, what do I want to know about? I'll go to there and then I'll go to there. I yeah. have not dared start it from the beginning because if I start at the beginning with the intention of working through to the end, <laughs> it's going to be all-consuming for a, two years when I already have 20 other books that and and papers that I've downloaded to read, scientific papers to read. Mm. This is too much to get through. I'm yeah. trying. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, no definitive answer to the question, but I hope we've clarified 
um, where your question may have been coming from. Uh, yeah, I would like. I, I really, yeah, uh, we weren't clear on what the real question was the there, so um, apologies for that. Yeah, because I think I misunderstood you. But yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, time flies, you know, Mr. Mm. Soskin. Jim Brown. Um, Jim. This well, we can deal with this very quickly. Jim, he says, I know this is a bit off topic, but I was wondering if there exists somewhere a curated list of books about archaeology. <laughs> And uh, after we've just flashed up a book, yes, it <laughs> yeah, is true. Yes, I wouldn't recommend those for beginners, would you? <laughs> it's uh, gathering time. No, no uh, I mean, uh, yeah. really, really important documents. These, um, yeah. but uh, Alistair I think McLaurin if you Francis want to buy them as a reference Bayless. work, that you sorry, uh, no, I was just going to say, I, I think if you want to get them as reference works to dip in when you want to look up something specific, yeah, they are. You know, then yeah, I'd recommend anybody to have. But if you want to know something generally, actually, do you know what we've talked about this before, and we will do a special on on books and books. Yeah, that, that we that's recommend. what that's what I put Jim's question up really as a cue to to say that it would be a good idea if we did a, a, well, a special. So, so as not to be apparently dismissive of his question, let us. Um, I, I I would say. Get yourself this one. Oh, yeah. Um, the Tale of the Axe. <clears throat> and uh, it's what it says on the tin. It really is the... Um, the ta it's the history of the axe and how it completely changed the world. And it, it really... Yeah, I'm taking it way, way back as well. You know, mm. back to Anatolia and... Uh, the Middle yes. East, uh, and uh, so recommend that very highly. It's um, uh, it's by David Miles, who's written loads of wonderful books on prehistory. Oh, <laughs> the trouble with you showing that is that it's as rare as hen's teeth. You oh, I'm sorry, is it? it? I can't, I can't believe that that it's it's rare and out of print. Uh, yes, but it was our it, Bible, you know, when we were making yeah. Standing with Stones. Julian, it's Coates. a fabulous book. If uh, you if you want a yeah. If you want a replacement Bible, because Julian Cope's book is hard to get hold of, yes. then oh, Me first. get yourself get, <laughs> <laughs> get yourself um, Andy's book, The Old Stones. Um, Andy Burnham. Yeah, Andy Burnham, top man. Um, it's a, it's a fantastic book. It's a list of sites around Britain and Ireland. Yeah. Um, and uh, loads of cracking information in there as well. I, I don't know how many hundreds of sites are in there. Um, anyway. Um, Mike Pitt writes so gorgeously. And you are a great book, it, yes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Anything you ever wanted to know about Durrington Walls is in here. Yes, that um, is true. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and he writes down. so well about not only about um, things but about people as well. And I'm talking about uh, archaeologists, you know, because there's fascinating stories in here about the rivalry between. Uh, uh, or, uh, I feel duty bound to show you this one. Alexander Keeler and uh, <laughs> what's her name? Damn. Who? Lady archaeologist. You know, I'm gonna, you're going to all blooming hate me now. Who? Alison Sheridan? Who? No. Who? <sighs> Talk amongst yourselves. You d tell the nice people about uh, our book. Okay, uh, there's uh, the Standing yeah. with Stones, the book. Well, it's still available from Thames and Hudson in America. Um, it's uh, currently uh, awaiting reprint over here, but we're probably going to um, do a different edition entirely. Uh but uh, uh, but yes, that's uh, uh, that's a fun one. Um, uh, what what are you doing? Are you recommending another book, or are you just no no? I was trying to find uh, somebody's name, and I have failed. Do you know <laughs> one of my favourites and most um, uh, influential uh, books um, because it inspired me. Um, yeah, John Hedges' uh, Tomb uh, of the Eagles. That sounds like it's you know really specific, and of course it is. Um, um, but the in the telling of the story, 
it's really educational about the process of archaeology as well, isn't it? So yeah. there's a human story in this um, with um, Ronald Simerson, of course, who was a farmer that owned uh, the land, but also his battles with academia and uh, how the two mm. came to an agreement <laughs> about yeah. how to uh, deal with the tune of the eagles. It's a really, it's a really good read. Uh, and I will show you this one. Oh. Uh, Aubrey Burr, because uh, we couldn't possibly talk about books and not put an Aubrey Burr in. Um, a Guide to the Stone Circles of Britain, Ireland and Brittany. Um, Aubrey Burr, uh, just, he died not very long ago. Um, and he he was a giant, an absolute giant of archaeology. Um, his contribution, I mean, he was our second Bible, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, very much so. And of course, the uh, the, the big one. And we must stop because we're doing the special. We're doing the special on books right here. In yeah, the, no, in you're, the right. Q &A. you're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. Stone Circle, Britain, exactly. Ireland, and, and Britain. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, David yeah. Salisbury uh, says the modern antiquarian, two used on Amazon, £305. There you go. Sorry to have recommended the uh, modern yeah. antiquarian. Yeah. Gee, well, if I'm short of a bob, we know where to. <laughs> mint condition as well yeah oh i think i lost you for a moment there okay um, um yes. i think we've uh, we've done that didn't mean to go we we will be doing a special well yeah we'll find the time to do that because there are so many good books that would be very useful to people yeah 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 okay that's jim jorman German. What is our favourite, most German? fascinating small object of prehistoric origin found in Britain, not including the bird-headed thingamabob? Right, here's another instance of, if I remember, I'm, I'll put a link up there to uh, Rupert and I discussing the bird-headed thingamabob, which if you've not seen, you'll find very amusing. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, I, to I answer German's uh, question. I should say right at the top, the bird-headed thingamabob is actually from Bulgaria. So, uh, Oh, it's from, <laughs> uh, it's Thracian. So it is, um, and uh, and therefore uh, doesn't not, answer this question. Not found question. in Britain. It was not found anyway, in Britain. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I continue. My my favourite uh, thing in Britain was something that I actually was not aware of until sometime in the last couple of years. That um, if you go to the uh, Wiltshire just, uh, Museum, um, just before we head our, off out there, uh, Libba says uh, archaeology texts are ludicrously expensive. Two two things there um, was a um, for what it is the modern antiquarian was a fabulous monstrously popular book in its genre you know and I can't I still don't understand why it's out of print but once mm. something does go out of print and is in demand that forces the price up yeah. archaeological texts are a different matter entirely um, they are so very specialized and the price is really um, it's just part of the academic flow through. Some are really expensive uh, if they're destined, you know, to be bought by universities and all the rest of it to rest on their shelves, to be accessed by libraries and all the rest of it. And some, of course, are free. I'm always, you know, some archaeological papers you do a search for and you think, oh, well, I'm not spending 60 quid just... Um, so I can answer a question on the prehistory show. <laughs> guys, <laughs> question time. And other times you go, oh, thank you very much, that's free. Have the, have the PDF, it's free. And, mm. you know, you get 100 and 200 well, page you know text. <clears throat> I, I will say this. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll say this because it, it, it's, it's actually, that in itself is a good point. Mm. That when we're researching for... Um, any of the shows that we give you or um, or any of the stuff that we we tell you mm. then sometimes we find stuff uh, initially we find it in uh, media articles from wherever in the world one of my favorite um, uh, sources is the Siberian Times believe Isn't it or not. great the Siberian Times <clears throat> it's a fantastic production yeah um, but my point is that um, because we um, we have an innate mistrust of the media because they do like to be clickbaity and 
um, and just exaggerate things. So without exception, we go back to prime source. Who are the archaeologists who are actually working on this? Yeah. And we go and get their papers and we read what, um, what they have written that has given rise to the media articles. So we're making sure that we're not telling you porky pies or over egging uh, something when we give you information. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and without exception... Well, no, not without exception, with very few exceptions. You can just access them from the university uh, uh, sources for free. Um, there are a few, depending on the scale of the research and what have you, there are a few that are behind paywalls and you have to pay a bit of money for. Yeah. But generally speaking, if it's... Um, uh, oh, and if you do come across a place where you think you're going to pay a fortune if you want to buy uh, a, a, a paper... Don't stop searching, because sometimes you'll find somewhere else where you can get it for free. Mm. It's not consistent. <clears throat> yeah, um, it's true. It's not consistent at all. Yeah. Um, you, however, yeah, I don't know if this is true uh, for a fact, but you know, sometimes you won't be able to tell the difference between a PhD and um, a, 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 and somebody's PhD uh, and you know an official paper by uh, Vince. Gaffney or Tim Darville or you know one of the tots. I don't know if that is a distinguishing factor. Obviously, a PhD paper is not going to you're not going to have to pay for. I wouldn't wouldn't mm. have thought. And mm. sometimes you know a PhD paper is going to be the the very thing that you want. Yeah. Uh, in terms yeah, of detail. Mm. Yeah. 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 Just can I just say. Um, this is fabulous to see. I know. We're, oh, hello, Marion. <laughs> Merrin. <laughs> Merrin's we book, she said, you. I hardly dare say this. No, oh, yes, you do. But my book is free to download. <laughs> wow. Excellent and good to hear. I'm sorry to hear that probably you're not making any money out of it, therefore, yeah, Merrin. That is, that is, oh, uh, yeah, that's a terrible thing when you hear that from any author. You know, when you, when you know how much work goes into writing a book. For those that uh, don't know, uh, Merrin uh, is somebody we did um, one of our first uh, interviews with, actually. And what yeah. fascinated us about uh, Merrin was her expertise in brewing and her thoughts about the prehistory of, of brewing and yeah. how it may be complete, uh, something that is really overlooked, especially in the prehistory of the, this country. And... Uh, uh, seek, uh, seek, um, Marin out and watch. It. Yeah, yeah. Uh, put a link in, Marin. So not only the book, but also the work you do, because I think a lot of people that may not have heard of you may be fascinated to hear what you've got to say. Can't say yeah, do. more stick here. It, stick it in the comments, Marin. What um, I was going to say though, and uh, just before uh, Marin popped up there, there are 150 people with us tonight, which is absolutely fabulous. Thank you lovely. so much, folks, for for joining in, and we're aware that we've sailed well. Past past the hour mark but we'll keep going we have but that means that uh quite a few quite a number of you um have not been here before so uh do don't be um afraid uh, do uh, put um a word or two in the chat here introduce yourself and say where you're from i'll tr i'll see and i'll do my best to say um <laughs> hello okay Sorry, we Dorman, you've been hanging on, if you're there, you've been hanging on for dear life here, waiting for us to get round to answer your blooming question. What's I'm going to put question? three straight up there for me, OK? These are the three that come straight off. Not just one, but three. I have to choose one. Stone balls from Scotland and elsewhere. Neolithic uh -huh. stone balls. Um, yeah. The um, um, Falkton drums. Completely oh, okay. yeah, cool. enigmatic, uh, white little three... Yeah. We, that we know of, uh, yes. different sized. They look like drums, but they're they're quite small. Um, they're smaller than they look. Uh, and made of the bush barrow lozenge. Okay. Okay. It's interesting that you should say the bush bush barrow lozenge. Yes. Uh, do you want to tell people what the bush barrow lozenge is? Um, yes, the bush barrow lozenge is in the um, uh, the uh, museum uh, of. The Wiltshire, Wiltshire Museum, Wiltshire Museum and Devizes. Um, it was found in the Bush Barrow, which is one of the barrows nearby Stonehenge in the Stonehenge uh, landscape. I can't 
remember what year it, it was uh, dug up, but it is of gold. It is a lozenge about that Big. size. <laughs> okay, and it's got inscribed, and it's got uh, it's quite a fine, fine piece, and it's uh, quite finely etched with a, a, a lozenge design, a r mm. repeating lozenge design on the inside. I mean, me, me describing it, what's the point? It's, it's one of those things you have to see. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what? I, I'm pretty sure you, they did it because of lockdown, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be available indefinitely. Um, but you can actually do a walkthrough at the Wiltshire Museum online. If you go to their website, I can't remember the address offhand, but just Google Wiltshire Museum. Um and uh, and you can you can do a virtual walk uh, walk through of the, oh, yes, of, you can. Uh, of the museum. Yes, you can. It's fabulous, and and it's funny that you would say the uh, the bush barrow lozenge because my favourite is also from the Wiltshire Museum, and uh, it's there's a dagger, and the uh, the handle the pommel of the dagger is decorated with hundreds. Of tiny... Jamie, J Jamie's just ordered your book, our book from uh, Stamford's for 20 quid. Hooray. Oh, well done. I, I presume that's what you mean, Standing with Stones, the, the book, uh, Jamie. You could be talking about... Oh, no, maybe you've just ordered Merrin's book. I don't know. <laughs> He's ordered a book, good man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the, very the, good. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of everything here. The comments, the chat, is, the making sure the questions talk. come I, I up. I get a bit distracted. I'm talking to Michael on Skype and coming to you, and it's all coming out to you it, via Michael Studio. <laughs> I'm not doing any of the hard work here at all. <laughs> um, no, my favourite, as I said, my favourite is uh, it's a dagger with the pommel decorated with these tiny oh, yeah. gold pins. And the reason I was so blown away by that is that, you know, you look at the, uh, the dagger itself and you think, wow, that's a piece of work. And then you see they put a, there's a little magnifying glass uh, down below the display with one of the pins that you actually look through the magnifying glass and there's this pin. And, and you, you look round the magnifying glass and it's like, good grief, how were they doing that? The, the dagger is decorated with hundreds of these things. They're um, only one step removed from dust, aren't they? In terms of <laughs> just, I just, I was blown away size. Yeah. by that skill. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, there you go. That's my answer. <laughs> Sibylla, no, you're not being uh, undisciplined uh, at all. Talking amongst yourselves, you you lot, uh, go for it. I, I it's one of the pleasures of uh, of running the show. Really, is like, just uh, like school, seeing no, folks chatting amongst the, <laughs> themselves here um, in the chat, uh, in the live chat. Brilliant! Knock <laughs> yourselves out. Um, I fear for the for the thank you for the question, John. And I I don't think we can expound much more on uh, really. on that right right now, especially as we're time is um, moving on rather swiftly. Uh, David, uh, David Schwartzman, um, why does Wayland Smithy have a Norse association? Oh, oh, and it's not a question we can answer. Not the why question. Um, no, the we same can question I was musing terms. earlier. No. Why does why is Arthur Stone in Herefordshire called Arthur Stone? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's got nothing to do with Arthur, and um, mm. um, neither has uh, the Long Barrow on the Ridgeway near the White Uffington Horse have anything to do with uh, what is it, Welland or Velland, 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 the um, blacksmith? Yeah, uh, um, it's lost ev to us. Ev every site uh, is, um, in, in fact, in many ways, it's the same as uh, you know the sites that have been built o over by the church. Um, that uh, they're kind of absorbed into the time, and there are many sites where. You know, we did the piece about the Rollwright Stones, where the myth is that it was, oh, uh, sure. you know, it's named after King Rollo. Yeah. Um, and, um, well, well, it might be named after him, but it predates him by quite a few thousand years. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so it's it's just somebody way back in in history made up a story, and it's the foibles of men, you know, that who the made that up. The short answer to David's done. the short answer to David quest David's question, if you forgive me, getting scatological, is that uh, when people don't know, they make shit up. <laughs> It is true, yes. Um, um, you know, and if the story's good, it sticks. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you can say, really. Yeah. Um, There's no real connection, obviously. Yeah. Shall we move on? I move hope on. that's uh, okay, David. Right. Um, my Life of Riley. Oh, dear. How long have you got, Rupert? How long has everybody got? What's the question? My life of Riley. Uh, if you're there, my life of Riley, uh, inf tell us what uh, how we should address you. If my life of Riley is fine, it's fine with us too. <laughs> I'm happy uh, for you. But we like we like real names. Uh, but I think my life of Riley is a good one. That's a good name to have on the on the internet. Have you any thoughts on the Isle of Man? <laughs> 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 Uh, Depends well, what sort of thoughts you mean, my life of Riley. So uh, so me, I was born there. Uh, I lived there. We for lived a there while. till I was six years old uh, when we uh, uh, um, moved to the mainland. Uh, my family connections uh, were quite deep on the Isle of Man. Um, my uncle Arthur was the first deemster of the Parliament of the Isle of Man. He's no longer with us, unfortunately, but it was a very strong connection to uh, the history of the island there. Uh, Roper, yes, you say. Uh, yeah, I lived there for um, for a couple of years. I lived in a oh, beautiful place called Ingebrek. Um, and uh, spent a lot of time with the prehistoric sites of the Isle of Man. Yeah. It Are is... you Manx, my life of Riley? Are you Manx yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but more pertinently to the prehistory of the Isle of Man and the uh, prehistoric monuments there, they're a, a rare collection, aren't they? They obviously have echoes of monuments elsewhere, particularly um, uh, Castellan Yard and uh, King Ory's it, Grave. It, it... It's hard to know really how to answer this without talking for hours, which we cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about the Isle of Man is that many of the sites are bordering on unique. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm thinking about Mull Hill specifically, that yeah. um, where would you suggest you could find anything similar? In Europe, one or two maybe. In, in terms of... Uh, British sites, nothing like it. Um, it's basically a circle of kists, um, burial chambers, uh, with another burial in the centre. I think there was another burial in the centre. It's not absolutely confirmed, but it's mm. just um, the burials are all in pairs, and there's yeah. a, uh, like a, a little alleyway between each each one. Yeah. Um, it, it's... Uh, an extraordinary place, and just the view out over the sea. All these sites yeah, are ima ima magical imagine places. Imagine a stone circle made of stone kists with a fantastic yeah. view, and and you're there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mull yeah. Hill is, uh, is, is fabulous. Um, uh, Matt uh, asked, isn't one of those tombs the one you sort of slid butt first into in a hole in the ground, Rupert? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah that's... Did. Um... <laughs> Uh, that is uh, that's probably one of my favourite places, just because it's. Mm. Um, I don't know anywhere else like it. That the the chamber itself, it's made of white quartz, quartz massive white quartz blocks. Yeah. And I was so tempted, although it would be wrong, um, I was so tempted to uh, go in there with a toothbrush and just clean the whole thing out, because. That must have been phenomenal when it was gleaming white quartz. Um, 
So you you slide down this little hole in the ground and find yourself. It's it's like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You just you, suddenly you're in this little white chamber. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Got some happy memories of being in there. But more importantly, there is more archaeological work that's been done on the Isle of Man than people think. <laughs> I mean, amazingly, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ubiquity, uh, Tim Darnell, is an important yes. figure in uh, the archaeology of the Isle of Man. Yeah. But the, if you take away one fact about the archaeology of, of the Isle of Man, in terms of uh, cultural, not just the, you know, the difference in, in the monuments themselves, it's the period in which there was connectivity between the Isle of Man and Ireland and um, across the other side of, of the Irish Sea um, to the west of uh, England and, and, and Scotland is the periods in which that, con that uh, stuff was going on. And round about 3000 BC, um, there stopped being that interaction, which is why Ronald, the, the, we have a distinctive Ronald's Way culture. Ronald's Way is down in the uh, south uh, east of the island, near the airport. Um, and uh, the pottery is named for that. There is such a thing as Ronald's Way pottery, which is distinct and marks the time when um, Isle of Man culture sort of gets separated from Irish and, and the rest of the stuff until it sort of joins up again in about 1500 uh, BC. And that's where the distinction has. There's this gap of um, mm. uh, 1,000, 1,500 mm. years where... The Isle of Man seems to have been a little bit uh, isolated and a law unto itself as far as cultural development is concerned. It's true. Interesting, though, that there's, uh, there, there was, last year, there was excavation at a Bronze Age site towards the north of the island that they found some jet jewellery, very beautiful jet jewellery, uh, there. And mm. the, uh, Chris uh, Newbury, I think, you're, I think you're in the wrong place, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Carry on, Rupert. Okay. Uh, the petrology on the jet showed that it came from Scarborough. Um, oh yes, yes. And uh, which is is right on the east coast of uh, of Britain. So you know that that travelled quite a long way. Whether it was taken there as raw materials to be made into jewellery on the Isle of Man, or whether it mm -hmm. was jewellery that was taken to the Isle of Man, don't know. But that's where the stone came from. So you know, clearly trade was, uh, you know, was active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just got, I didn't, was able to mention that because I came across a study of uh, stone axes in the Isle of Man, which it mm. may be worthwhile having a, a look at at some point. Mm. Uh, they were coming from all over up until three thousand uh, BC. Um, yeah. Yay! We could go on about the Isle of Man for a long time. The archaeology there is phenomenal. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the Manx Museum in Douglas as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Yep, yep, yep. All right, those are our thoughts for the time being. My life of Riley yeah. on upon the Isle of Man. Thank you very much indeed for that. And you know what? We've come to the very last question from Lectica. Right. When and where were the earliest known was an earliest known pottery made? And two, when and where was the first known thrown pottery made? Oh, that's a lovely question. It's a lovely yeah. question. Well, mm -hmm. ooh, um, the earliest known pottery is from China and it is 20,000 years old mm. um, and I, th I think we were talking about this earlier Mike we should it, we should always emphasize and it doesn't matter what we're talking about uh, in terms of discoveries that mm. when we say the oldest anything it is the old the oldest known the oldest that has ever been found so far so when it's something that is so... <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris Newbury says these guys seem like the typical university types. <laughs> if only he knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the so oldest pottery is from China. Um, the oldest pottery in uh, outside of China is way later you're talking about um in uh in fact we were talking earlier on we were talking about um the pre-pottery uh cultures yes so you've got pre-pottery a b and c uh and uh, so 
so you, you've gone from 20,000 years old in China hmm. to pre-pottery, which is in um, Anatolia and Mesopotamia, so, uh, you know, Middle East, which is, uh, let's round it off and say 10,000 years. Uh, now, there's no way you can think that this was going on in China 20,000 years ago and nobody else was making stuff out of clay between them, you know, for 10,000 years. Yeah. It's just we haven't found it. Um, and, and the first throne pottery, yeah. um, that's something else entirely. There, there is not an established date for that. Um, the, the earliest known uh, wheel uh, was Sumerian. You mean pottery wheel? Potting wheel. Pottery wheel. wheel. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, <laughs> the earliest potter's wheel known is uh, is Sumerian, and um, I, I, do you know what? I can't remember the dating of that wheel, but the oldest known thrown pottery is between uh, four and six thousand years. Um, BC. So round that to 5,000. Let's just say 5,000 BC. So mm. there's a difference between the earliest known pottery at 20,000 to the earliest known <laughs> throne pottery. We at aim 5, to please, 000. tree dude. We, <laughs> we aim to please. <laughs> <laughs> tree dude. Well, too much yeah. head scratching. You guys yeah. crack me up, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and that's about it. I mean, we've said what we can say about that because that's all there is to know, isn't there? Uh, do you know, I think the enthralling stuff about... Uh, see, there's, there's something about pottery that to me is, is a little bit more exciting than when people were cutting, uh, just making things out of stone. That something that you've, you've made it from nothing. You yeah. know, you've taken gloop out the ground and you've formed it into something that's exactly how you want it. And... Uh, it's it's it starts to get personal again, you know, fingerprints in clay. Yeah, yeah. And you know what the point came up about pre pre pottery, and I think it, it's such a misnomer, isn't it? Pre pottery, how can there be pre pottery yes. pottery? Um, mm. uh, and I think the distinction is between ceramics pottery and um, use of other materials. Um, you know, hard, mm. isn't it? Well, pottery is clay. Yes. By definition. Yes, but pre-pottery B and pre-pottery A, we're talking about non-ceramic materials that were being carved. Not necessarily, no. You're talking about, I mean, you've got clay figurines in pre-pottery A and B. Yes, but it doesn't necess but it, but it doesn't have to be clay to be classed in the in the pre-pottery culture. Well, if you're talking culture. about alabaster, alabaster, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, well, they include that in the culture. But yeah. But but that's what it means. That's, that, that's the misnomer. Pre-pottery doesn't refer to an artifact. It refers to a culture. Mm. That's the confusion, I think. Uh, and I hope that's cleared that up for you, uh, Sibylla, okay, well, because it's sort, sort, of, yeah. sort of asked uh, that. And it's an interesting yeah. point, actually, because pre-pottery, you know, i.e. really, really old stuff, if it's been carved in alabaster, it looks far, far more refined than stuff, later stuff, much, much later right. stuff that's made out of ceramics. That's so it, it, it can appear much younger than it really yes. is. So, so some of the really ancient uh, uh, pre-pottery stuff can, can, uh, can yeah. look extraordinarily yeah. refined, uh, but simply because it's made out of, you know, with great skill, obviously, made out of... Um, um, other materials, uh, harder materials. Mm. It's just been a little bit, of, uh, um, a little conversation, a few questions uh, asked um, uh, in in the chat there. I just, I just wondered if if it's something that needs to be addressed because obviously we get a lot of new people popping in. You know, we, we our numbers have gone up from what uh, we're we're nearly 170 viewers at the moment. It Hello, is. Everybody. I wonder if. It's worth sort of laying our cards on the table about where we're coming from as far as prehistory is concerned. <laughs> Do you know when we, uh, when when we start off, some people have got some sort of context for where we're coming from, just because people pop in because they see there's a live show or you know it's the prehistory guys, and uh, that could mean any number of things. 
Mm. Um, so, uh, um, a bit late now, perhaps, but. <laughs> well, yeah, we could do a special on that. Yeah, um, yeah. we. <laughs> but it is some. It is something along the lines. Uh, it, it's one or two people sort of may have mistaken us for academics. Uh, you know, because of the way we talk, and the, you know, because of the basis upon we're, which we take our the, information. The is, we're we're not. Saying, sorry, go on, Rupert. No, it's just because I, I, I'm always going to correct you on that when you say we're not. The point is that we're not. <laughs> we're not academic archaeologists. No. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we approach this very academically. Um, uh, we are generalists. Uh, and we are critical thinkers, and we make sure that the prehistory information we give you is... Um, we, can, we can point you in the direction of where we got the information. Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, and so basically, okay, so, okay, our remit, what we do in a nutshell is we, we find all this, the prehistoric stuff and work that's being done all around the world and, you know, or even if it's not new, just important stuff that generally people don't know. And we try to bring that all together and present it to, uh, to you, to people at large who are interested in, uh, in prehistory, but really wouldn't know how to get access to this, even if you knew that it was there. There's so much stuff that people don't even know the research. People don't even know that somebody has thought about doing the research in so many areas until yeah. somebody goes, here's this. And you know, good God, doesn't know anybody was, yeah. you know. Um, and there's so much stuff that's news to us. We, you know, we're looking all the time, yeah. literally all the time. Yeah. And we're finding out stuff, you know, every week there's something that really, yeah. um, I have 40 tabs open at any one time, which has got archaeological something yeah. from around the world. Um, Bronze Age horsemanship is one of the things that I've got up at the yeah. moment. They've just discovered some new bridles and stuff from the Bronze yeah, Age. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I brought this up is, is because uh, Chris uh, here, you know, is asking us questions about, you know, for example, he's just said, uh, what do we think about Stonehenge, Woodhenge, and the Tawinak... <laughs> Tamanaku being on perfect uh, circle of equal latitude for naval uh, navigation. Um, I um, don't know because I've never heard of that. Um, uh, um. <laughs> and you know, it's a, it's an idea the, uh, which it's it's perfectly valid to pursue, um, but. Um, Unless you can apply critical thinking to the thinking behind the theory, then it's not going to get you anywhere because you can't prove anything. No, I, I think the the only time it becomes provable is if is if you have uh, a constant measure. If there is if there is a given distance between twenty sites, then you can't say that's coincidental or accidental. Um, but if they're just sites that sit on a line, then my answer is always going to be so what? Because you can draw a line in any direction and something's yeah. going to fall on it. Um, uh, which is why we generally dismiss the notion of stone rows being uh, astronomical alignments or what have you. The, you mm. know, the, a line's always going to point at something. Okie dokie. I think we're kind of coming to a close here. I hope that uh, sort of clears things up. Uh, that's not to, doesn't mean to say, you know, that we're stuck with what archaeologists and academics uh, tell us uh, and their interpretations of uh, what we disagree uh, with them on. very often, we, and we tell yeah, them so. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's the it's the depth. It's it, we are in huge admiration of the, the depth and work and the dedication of academic archaeologists that, you know, are working all over the world, uh, beavering away and, yeah. uh, you know, doing the grunt and grind work and, and coming up with the data. And it's only the data that we can, uh, yeah. you know, we, we can work with if we're going to come to any conclusions about yeah. no, they, they uh, do stuff so long ago. Work. And, yeah. uh, and when we're very lucky that... Uh, in the main, uh, they all seem to like what we do and are very supportive and helpful when we ask for their support. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, 
It is all good. Uh, talking of which, <laughs> uh, next interview coming up is with uh, Professor Vince Gaffney. Mm. Um, he of uh, the recent discovery of the um, pits or uh, shafts around Dorrington walls. Uh, Vince is absolutely fascinating, jo not just for, for that, but because <laughs> the techniques used to discover those pits and shafts are, of course, uh, remote sensing technologies, and Vince has been behind really the development of uh, those techniques in this part of the world hence his in archaeology yeah. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, and, so uh, that that interview is coming up uh, next anything else we can speak of coming up next well just uh, but vince though you've got to say about vince he's such a good storyteller too he's got some cracking stories he was a joy to talk to yeah 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 um, so so we've got an over over an hour interview uh, with him uh, yeah. He'll be in the next prehistory show as well. <clears throat> yes, he will. Yes, he will. Um, yeah. Um, good grief! What else are we making at the moment? We've got so many. Well, the next prehistory show. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Yes, that, <laughs> that is. Uh, that's in the moment. We have, we've got uh, the next uh, Patreon live is coming up. That's obviously not on YouTube. That's um... See, J James has gone gone away with a feather in his cap. You know, because, <laughs> because now James is up there with Tim Darville as as his. Thinking of, uh, of of long barrels looking like axe heads, yeah, <laughs> splendid. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for subscribing. Bless you. All right. Anyway, with that, I think it is time to say uh, tara to you, good folk. We've been with yeah, thanks for, for over folks. an hour it's, and a uh, half. Well over an hour and a half now. So uh, um, don't want to test yeah. you all too we're far. We're very grateful. We're very grateful. I'm, uh, <laughs> I tell you what, I am going to step outside because it is like a sauna in here and I've drunk uh, two litres of water <laughs> while we've been talking. <laughs> and <laughs> just, oh dear, um, I wish I could. Oh, I just, I'm melting. Uh, mm. well, I mean, mine's, my mind says uh, play us out on uh, I wish I was a standing stone, could you? <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if I can. Hold on. I can. I'm going to do it. I'm going to play us out. Look, guys, this the 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 song is is four minutes long, so you can leave whenever you like. But I'm now going to hit play uh, on this. Hopefully, it'll play from my machine out out to you. So for ha happy times. <laughs> um, see you all soon. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us, folks. See you. I was a standing stone Standing tall and all alone In the middle of the moor No one knows what you're for I wish I was a standing stone Standing tall and all alone In the middle of the field Your secrets are concealed If you pass your children through this I wish I was a lanyard coit Smooth and flat without a point Stood against the Cornish sky You're on the cover of the reason why Stonehenge Was it for pagan sacrifice? Price. 
Although the gift shop is quite 